Hello, everyone. Thank you for being here with us today. I'm Becky Serson, the Endeavor Lab lead here at Endeavor Miami. Today, we have a special guest from our Endeavor Network to talk about a very important and often overlooked topic, go-to-market strategy. Juan Pablo Jimenez is our guest today. He is an Endeavor mentor, and he is the chief commercial officer of Kushki. Kushki is a world-class pay tech connecting Latin America with digital payments and helping businesses there reduce the cost and complexity of digital transactions, all while improving acceptance rates and reducing fraud. Less than a decade in existence, Kushki has been classified as a unicorn and operates in five countries, including the United States and Ecuador. Before Kushki, Juan Pablo was the COO of Citrix, a US-based cloud computing and virtualization company that produces software designed to provide secure access to applications and content. Welcome, Juan Pablo. Becky, thank you very much for the invitation. Of course, thank you for being here. So Endeavor mentors like yourself are the ones that make it possible for founders at various inflection points to avoid common fit pitfalls in their entrepreneurial journey. I'd love for us to get started with you sharing a bit about your story as a professional and how you got involved with Endeavor. Becky, thank you. Thank you. Thank you again for the invitation. I um, I started my career uh, in packaged goods a long time ago, more than 25 years ago. And really because at that time, what, what, what was very cool was to be in those type of companies that were growing very fast. So I started there uh, selling to a lot of, uh, let's say, a lot of consumers. Then I moved to technology, and I started working in consumer electronics uh, with Hewlett Packard. I worked with Hewlett Packard for something around 15 years, and I moved around uh, to different countries. I, I was in Colombia, in Mexico, in Brazil, in Texas. And recently, I moved to Citrix for 10 years. I moved to the cloud. It was a very interesting topic to, to work with and in a very different model, and it was kind of a starting to be very important, and right now it's taking over the world, which is super interesting. And more recently, I mean, after 28 years in the corporate world, I decided to move to the startup world and I joined uh, Kushki one year ago. I'm super excited, super happy, and really learning a lot about what what means to be an entrepreneur. That's amazing. Tell me, tell me a little bit about that. So you've worked in huge corporations like Citrix, HP, Kimberly Clark, all while you were mentoring entrepreneurs. And now here you are on the other side of things, working at a startup yourself. What has that experience been like and what have you learned? No, no, good question, Becky. Um, I have to say that uh, since I started in Kuski one year ago, I'm really, really changing and evolving the way that I do uh, mentoring uh, with Endeavor. So, so um, in big corporations, um, in reality, I like to say that uh, you don't really invent a lot of things because because you are really making things more efficient. I mean, you have a lot of people thinking. I mean, think about this. I mean, Hewlett Packard, we were more than 100,000 people in the company. So it was it was that like a, somebody is doing something like a, what I'm doing, let's say, in Latin America, in another region of the world. And it was very easy to call that person and learn. So the cross-pollination between a lot of people in those corporations is great. Mm -hmm. A lot of the structure and, and, a, and a lot of people thinking. So usually in those companies, you have people thinking at a certain level, and then you have some other people executing. So, so really, the opportunity in those companies to learn uh, I mean, new models, new frameworks. I mean, what's happening in different countries of the world is spectacular. That was great. When I moved to Kushki, it was super inter interesting because it was a place where if I had a challenge, I didn't have anybody to call. I mean, well, like myself solving everything uh, and I didn't have uh, experts in the different area that I had before. So I had to be myself calling friends and trying to, to use what I learned and my experience in really, in really, in really changing or really designing things. A lot of uncertainty and a lot of ambiguity in, in an entrepreneur uh, world uh, because really we were trying to introduce new products and new ways of doing things and we didn't know really how that was going to be received by the market. And, and very importantly, um, in this new world, you need to be very, very flexible and you need to be ready to pivot. It's not like a to pivot only in the product that you are selling, but pivot in the way that you are doing sales, in the way that you are doing marketing, in the way that you are doing uh, different type of things, because, because you are growing very fast and, and really you are not yet established. So you have to really be moving and understanding what's happening. So for me, 
thing and endeavor six years more or less i've been with you guys uh it's kind of a tremendous adventure and i'm and i'm focusing my mentorships more right now in how can we mix the structure and the frameworks that i have from working more than 20 years in 28 years in corporations with working right now what means to be working right now in a startup no wow what what a wealth of of knowledge that you you share there um, I'd love to use that as a segue to move into our topic of the day today, go to market strategy. I'd love to start with the very basics. Could you share with us what is a go to market strategy and why should, why do founders need to have one? Yeah, no, that, that's important. And, and then after talking, after being with more than 20, 25, no more than 30, 30 entrepreneurs, um, usually what I see is that entrepreneurs have a very nice idea they begin developing a product and they are the go-to market. I mean, they know the product, they know the customer, and they begin to do some sales with uh, friends or with some people in their network. And they're experts. And they think that it's super easy to sell because I already sold to two or three or three places. And they begin to think time to expand. And when, when, when it's time to expand, I see different type of uh, reactions. So one is that uh, spray and pray. So, hey, let us do a lot of advertising and let's see what, happen, what happens. Or let us hire a friend that doesn't have a job but can help us out selling uh, because that person can help us to sell. Or let's go social because if I do something in Facebook or in Instagram, customers are going to call me. Or let us do Google Ads. Or you know what? A friend told me that I need to purchase a database and begin calling people in the database. So I see a lot of... A lot of um, uh, let's say, uh, uh, activities that are not connected really with something. And this is where I can define go-to-market or sales with something that is not really a science. And, and really for me, selling and the practice of really building a robust go-to-market is a science. It's a science that has a framework, a methodology. It has processes. It needs people. It needs a structure in different, in different places. It needs uh, uh, systems. And when you think like that, and when you begin really building a good and nice go-to-market strategy, you begin to reduce the human component in the sales decision. Meaning that in every pitfall that you have in the process, you can stop, think, and you can find ways to really solve what's happening. And the reason why I'm telling you this is because it's very common. In every meeting that I have with an entrepreneur, they tell me, you know what? I'm talking to you, but don't worry. I have this big deal that is millions of dollars, and I've been working in that deal for one year. I'm going to close it this Monday. Yeah. One month later, they're going to close it the next Monday, and the next Monday, and the next Monday. So I like to tell them, look, I mean, you're having breakfast, lunch, lunch, and dinner with the same deal, and nothing is happening. And you are preventing yourself from really building something more sustainable and something that can really be scalable and can help you to move to the next stage, uh, uh, Becky. So, so in reality, for me, go to market or sales I mean, it's a science and it's something that we need to be very thoughtful about it and that we need to think like uh, when we were building our product uh, a group our processes and our methodologies is the same thing you should have like a, the same uh, mindset when you build your go to market strategy becky that's great advice thank you so much for sharing that i'd love to dive in a little bit deeper so you mentioned, for example, that it's very important to have all these processes in place, this strategy. If I'm a founder, say that have I have a business, I found my product market fits, I have just started selling, I've gotten a handful of customers. What should I do next? How do I proceed to make sure that I have this structured, repeatable sales process that is going to last me at least for a couple of months, ideally for a couple of years as the business grows? Yeah, no, good question. I am, um, usually I start my mentorship asking them questions because they always tell me, look, I mean, I have a product fit already. I know what I'm selling and I know who my customer is. So what I need is to, you to tell me how many salespeople I need to hire and where and what should I do? And then I said, hold on one second. Let me ask you a couple of questions and let us find out if we are ready to, to hire salespeople. And usually I start, I start asking them about uh, the market and about the customer. So, uh, because, and, and also about the value proposition itself. So tell me what, what that you sell. 
let me, let me let me try to put it myself. So I try to explain them what they sell. And usually they say, no, 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 that's not what I sell. So we, we have like an exercise of trying to really find out really what they sell. And 100%, 100% of the time, I find that the value proposition is not clear. So they don't, they don't have clarity about really what they're really offering to the customer. What are the benefits that the customer is really getting from what they're selling? And usually uh, when I ask them about benefits is not, do, do not tell me that it's going to reduce um, cost. Tell me how much cost this is going to reduce. And I tell them, look, I mean, if you want to have a very robust and powerful value proposition, you need to do something that increases revenue, reduce cost, increases or increases profits or reduce risk, which is super important right now. Those four components. So, so I start to work with them about building what they have in their mind, in their brain, putting them in, putting that like in a PowerPoint or like in a piece of paper so they can explain very easy. Look, I mean, I do this uh, for you and I can reduce this, increase this, and you're going to be better because what I'm offering you is whatever I'm offering to you. So that's kind of the first exercise that I tell them. Let us try to test if you are really offering something that customers are going to really, really uh, find attractive. The second one, the second one is the segmentation. That's super important. I, I, I like to say that usually we begin saying I'm going to, to spray and pray. Hey, what's your segment? No, no, I, I want to sell to everybody. Mm -hmm. I want to sell in every state of the US. I want to sell in whatever the customer is, every, I mean, anywhere in the world. And I'm like, uh, usually what that ha when that happens, you have two problems. One is that you might be offering something that is not attractive for that customer that you are, you are trying to, to attract. But second, you're an entrepreneur. You're not like a big corporation. Because if you focus and you try to sell not to thousands of customers, that are not kind of connected in any way, but to one, two, or three, it's going to be more effective trying to sell to one, two, or three. So the second, the second step is let us work in really that value proposition that we developed. How is that that value proposition is really addressing the need of certain certain segments? Segmentation can be I'm going to sell in one country because I do something special in that country mm -hmm. that nobody does, or a specific size of customer or any specific industry or any specific uh, uh, vertical. If you are if you're an entrepreneur in the States, it's not smart trying to sell in the whole America. I mean, when you try to sell to the whole America, it's very difficult because it, this is like a 50 or more countries in one single country. So let, let us try to find out if I want to sell to one industry, to maybe one region, to maybe one state, to maybe one county. So those are the type of questions that I begin asking. So you can begin connecting your uh, value proposition with your customer and your segmentation. The other one is, okay, so now, now we know that. Now let us think about how it is that we are going to reach our customers. Not only reach from the point of view of marketing, because usually you say, no, I know that I can do something in Instagram and I have a friend that is very good with Facebook and Google Ads, and so let us hire somebody. No, no, before we do that, let us try to find out, find out how that those customers purchase products. So it's like uh, something that they can purchase in the internet uh, very automatically, let's say, and uh, virtual. Is this something that requires you to go there and explain, to do a demo or maybe do a pilot? Is this something that requires to have a specific uh, certifications because you are selling to the government, for example, in order to sell to government uh, accounts? So how is that we are going, going, are going to address the way that these customers are purchasing? So that's kind of the fourth the fourth step that usually I ask them. And then we can begin to brainstorm about, do I want to hire a couple of people that can go and sell? Do I want to build a referral program where I'm going to find out uh, experts in certain industries and I'm going to give them any type of a fee because they are allowing me to go into accounts recommending me my product? Am I going to use uh, system integrators because what they do is that they integrate for big companies, they integrate software so mm -hmm. I can put my software there. So there are way too many ways that we can do that we can do to really reach customers. So so those are the type of type of conversations that we need to have, Becky, when we are building our go to market strategy. Oh, that's amazing. Thank you so much for sharing all of that really valuable advice. I love that you gave literally a four step plan that founders can have that when they're building their go-to-market strategy, they can check these things off as they work through them and then look at these bigger uh, questions of how many people do I hire, et cetera, et cetera. Um, 
I want to ask, do you have any last words of advice to share with founders listening? So I, I would say that, uh, I mean, I, I love to be with you guys. I've been with Endeavor six years. I know what Endeavor is capable of. I like the Endeavor Love program. <laughs> it's a good way to enter into the Endeavor uh, world and to talk to like to, to people like me. I mean, I'm, I'm here to, to share my experiences and also to learn to do networking and to work together. So my advice is, I mean, if you have, uh, 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 if you have go-to-market, uh, uh, let's say, challenges and you want to really learn more, and be part of the Endeavor world, I think it's a tremendous opportunity, Becky, to, to do that, no? Thank you so much, Juan Pablo. It was great talking to you, learning from you, and we look forward to seeing you again soon. Thank you, Becky. Thank you very much for inviting me.